Welcome back to the table. Today, Ryan and I are going to give you a preview of The Witcher Path of Destiny. If you're familiar with the channel at all, you've known that we've played a fair amount of The Witcher Old World yeah. and enjoyed it very much. This is the follow-up Witcher game from Go On Board. Big difference here. Well, a few big differences. One, I mean, it's a very, very different game. Yeah, don't, don't bury the lead. It's incredibly different. But two... This one actually embraces a lot of the characters that you're familiar with from the Witcher books, video games, etc. Yeah. And they're all front and center in this game. I am playing Geralt right here in front of me. And I have Vesemir, characters yeah. that you probably recognize if you've at least seen the show. Or played the video game, or, for sure. Or played the video game. And this takes a very different approach from the old world. The old world took place hundreds of years before the Witcher that you know. This game not only takes place during the same time frame as like the books and the show and the video game, it actually does kind of draw inspiration from those stories directly as you're playing through actual events that did happen in the books and in the show kind of as they were based on each other a little bit. Yeah, we had a chance to play this at Gen Con, a demo of it, and we've had since a chance to play it a little bit more. And I'll say the same thing now. This is a very interactive way of experiencing those stories. And yeah. these stories are Effectively, the short stories from the books from the, in terms of their very origin. Uh, we played one right here called The Lesser Evil. If you're familiar with a lot of storylines here, this is the story of Tre Stregobor and Renfri and which side do you choose. Yeah. This game, like the old world, uh, has a lot of those moral decisions. In fact, I'd say moral decisions feel like they're at the core of every decision you're making in this game. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, from a gameplay standpoint, every game is going to play through one of those books. And they're all kind of, they follow a similar format in that you're given some kind of introduction to the scene or introduction to the story. Again, very heavy on narrative. And then like David said, it presents you with a series of moral decisions. Every chapter, which is effectively a round of the game, you're ultimately going to have to decide to take your characters on one path or the other. You know, the path of destiny. Very clever. Uh, but you don't get to actually just choose which way you want to go. There's no negotiation here, really. Uh, the, the fact that you're choosing this, uh, which side you're choosing, is based on gameplay decisions that you make as you play cards. Yeah, playing cards is the core mechanic of the game. But let's take a look at what we have here on the table. They've got this incredibly tall, long, <laughs> slender board. And what you're going to see here is at the top, there's a score track. Then we've got the place for the book. The book is going to come in this, at least in our prototype, a pack of cards here. And you're gonna flip these pages. You're gonna read some, there's a lot of, a lot of rich flavor text. Um, but then you're going to eventually get to a page that looks like this. And these pages are effectively where the first round is going to take place in this story, in, at least. And this is going to outline the different symbols you're going to wanna to collect that are sort of the active symbols. In this case, we have exploration and magic. And then there are two other symbols, fight and diplomacy, that are inactive or yeah. non-active for this sort of portion of the story. And these represent, again, in this story, the sides of Renfri and Stregobor. But to play, you're going to play cards. And we've got all these cards here. This is the end of our game, but at the beginning of each round, there's going to be cards dealt to these spaces here. These are effectively going to be cards that will be drafted by the different players. And we have a two-player game set up here, so we have the last space empty. But all the players are going to start up here, and each chapter or each book actually has a starting initiative order for all the different players yeah. or characters that you're going to play as. And every round, you just take turns drafting a set of cards and then playing a set of cards. And these drafts are set up already here, so when you're drafting, you can take both cards in one section. For example, I could come here and take both these cards into my hand, or... I could guarantee that I'm going to go first next round by drawing off the top of the deck because every round there's going to be initiative order based on where you end up placing in this line. Now, in this particular scenario, we actually have some tokens even set up that impact your choices. So you're not just trying to decide which row of cards to take. This is going to have you draw some special cards. And this is a good time to mention that every one of these books is going to have its own set of components, its own set of setup instructions, and some almost like little mini games, you might yeah. want to call them, that are happening while you're playing through the actual book that you chose. Yeah, those books can feel very different. We yeah. played in the demo we played, I think we did the Striga at Gen Con. Uh, we have three, I believe there may be more, but these are the three chapters. We got the Striga, Edge of the World, and then this one here, which was the lesser evil. And like Ryan said, they feel significantly different. 
the core mechanic of what you're doing here yeah. is quite similar, but there's a lot of other things going around on the board and around it that make them feel quite a bit differently. For instance, the Striga had some secret objectives up at the top that you could do things in order to sort of peek at them. Once you uh -huh. played X number of a certain color card in your tableau, you could take a look to see, oh, at the end of the game, that's something I could be going for. Yeah, now the, the playing the tableau is the core of the game because after you draft those two cards, you're going to have a hand full of a variety of cards. You've got some starting cards. Each character starts with their own starting hand. And then you've got the cards that you drafted and you're playing two of them. Now deciding which two cards to play is the core decision in the game because it's a very tough decision. There's a lot of things you have to factor into when playing cards. They all have a colored banner, which can serve a variety of different purposes. They all have some symbols in the upper left hand corner, again, which serve a variety of purposes. And then they'll have an ability at the bottom. Maybe. Maybe, <laughs> I guess not all of them do, but a lot of them have abilities. So you kind of have to decide what to play because some of these cards will trigger off of other things. Some cards might trigger off of having already played a sword symbol, which is attack, or they might trigger off of having played several blue banner cards in a row. However, you're kind of building out your tableau, they're gonna kind of trigger in a very specific way. And so there's a huge timing element to playing these cards. Yeah, it's really interesting. You can see a card in your hand and you might go, oh, I need a yellow card so that this one will fire off because this requires a yellow card. The other thing that's going to be happening, at least in the decision space, is the icons you're trying to collect are very important relative to the two paths you're going to go on. Because at the end of the round, it's going to determine each time, three times throughout a particular chapter, which one of these will potentially be the dominant symbol yeah. at the end of this chapter. The dominant symbol is going to score points for everyone for all of that symbol they have in their tableau. And the other one is going to score experience, which brings us to our player board. Each character has a player board that has an experience track across the top. That experience is going to do a couple different things. It's going to, one, unlock some of these special abilities yeah. that you have on the main part of your player board. As you get those, those are one-time use for the game. You flip the token back over when you use it. But the other thing is if you really go hard on the experience, you can actually go off the top and then bring this sort of golden marker on, and that's going to ultimately score you points. Another way to score points in this, there's basically two significant ways to do that, through yep. the experience, through maybe some of the chapter-specific or story-specific mechanisms, and then everyone's gonna have also an end-of-game card here for the cards that you might have left in your hand. Yeah, so this everyone for the basic ones that we've used, the basic side quests, want you to have a certain number of colored cards. So you're trying to collect those over the course of the game, and you're also trying not to play them. It's very tempting to play them at some points and right. realize, oh, I was holding on to these. Uh, for a very a specific reason. Now, a lot of what you're doing with these, these cards is like David said, collecting the symbols. Some of these symbols are in the form of tokens. In fact, some of these cards might say, turn a token in to get other tokens or even cross off some symbols in your tableau with those little cross off tokens to get other symbols. You're counting up all the symbols, but the way that your decision is made is different than you might think. You don't just count up the symbols and say, we're going that way. Each player counts up their own individual symbols and then they get one vote for that direction. So in this particular case, we're looking for exploration and magic. It doesn't matter if I have 20 exploration and one magic, I just get one vote towards exploration. Right. Every other player might just have you know one magic a piece, but we might end up ultimately going magic. However, every round, we're going to assign one of these. So if after the first two cards, we're going magic, after the second two cards, we might be going exploration. And so you're kind of watching that because like David said, you're either getting points or experience, and you might want a different one. You don't necessarily always want the points. Sometimes you want the experience in order to unlock those powers. So watching that and trying to predict what other players are gonna do is kind of key to the game. Yeah, not to mention its effect on the storyline. So thematically, there are going to be some things here, at least in this case, you're effectively either helping and or dealing with Renfri yeah. or Stregobor. And you're gonna look at each of these pages and see that if this is the page, the path that we go on. The next chapter, we get a sneak preview yeah. at the symbols that are going to be active for them. So you might take into consideration, you know, some of the cards that you have left in your hand. You're going to lose almost all of the cards yeah. except for one in your tableau, as well as all of those tokens. So it effectively refreshes for the next chapter of this story, if you will. And we're ultimately going to play three chapters. And at the end of that, we're going to determine basically who has the most points that will be scored at the end of each round. 
and the experience is taken into consideration. Then we're gonna look at that card yeah. to see if we potentially were able to save enough cards in our hand to score some points that way. Yeah, and like we said, there's going to be other scoring opportunities as introduced by the different scenarios. We had one that gave points at the end of the game for secret objectives. This one introduces those cards that you're gonna to get to play every round. So it really is a race to victory points, but there's just, there's so much balancing that you have to do between the victory points and the uh, experience. And then there's these signpost tokens you get if you have the most of one yes. of them. So sometimes you want them and sometimes you don't. Yes, that is. So you that have is, to kind of balance that as well. Yeah, you with a the thematic storyline involved and the Witcher in particular, you never know whether something's going to be necessarily a good thing yeah. for you or a bad thing for you. The other cool thing about that as it relates to these stories is they don't all necessarily end in this, the same way you'd expect if you've read them. Because there are, I think, I, I want to say eight. I'm not sure if it's eight, but there's definitely multiple branches to this and multiple endings that could go for Renfri, could go for Stregobor, and end in very, very different oh, yeah. ways. We don't want to spoil any of that, but ours was pretty climactic <laughs> and unlike what I think, I think happened right, in the exactly. story. <laughs> and yeah, because each one of these branching paths takes you in a different story. So even if you've played through a book before, you're still going to get a different version of that story because you're definitely not going to make the same decisions. And even if you make a different decision on the very first one, it does branch in a totally different direction. They don't all come back to the same ending. There's, like David said, right. a wide variety of different thematic endings that do come with their own benefits and things like that as well. Yeah, so that is The Witcher Path of Destiny. If you have any questions at all about it, please make them in the comments below. We'll get down there and answer whatever we can. Hopefully we'll try at least one more chapter, then we'll have all three <laughs> done so we can answer yep. any of your questions. And until next time, make sure everyone has fun at the table, and we'll see you then.